Hello, everybody. My name is Tanya Nelson, and I'm London Area Director at Arts Council England. Arts Council England is the main funding body and development agency uh, in England. And um, I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing this session where we're gonna be considering the future of museums. I think we all rely on museums and archives um, to teach us about the past using uh, objects, paperwork, documents, um, but the rise of immersive technologies um, coupled with artificial intelligence are really providing unprecedented opportunities not only to bring the past to life, but to also think about our collections and archives as data that can be used to shape the future. Um, the idea for this session actually came from the world of dance. There's a British uh, choreographer by the name of Wayne McGregor, who's been working with Google to create an AI enabled choreography tool that will help him design and create new dances. And the data behind that is his personal archive of videos of his previous work. And this made me really think about, you know, how will collections and archives be used in the future? Um, how does this kind of concept apply in the museum world? And so I was really, really keen to get together this panel of people that I have with me today to talk about that issue. So um, I want to introduce the panel. Um, I have with me Lawrence Childs, who's head of uh, digital services at the National Gallery in London. Uh, Michael Takio Magruder, who is an artist and Sarah Coward, who is CEO of the Forever Project. And what I'd like to do to kick off this discussion is to ask each of the panelists to paint a picture for us of the future of museums, drawing on the experience of their work, their expertise and background. So um, let's kick it off with Lawrence. Lawrence, tell us about what you think the future of museums will be. Thank you, Tanya. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, these provocations. Um, I think that the museum or gallery in the future will have the potential to tell the rich and varied stories of their collections in very different ways and will probably be much more tailored and personalised to the individual. Um, we know that museums are places that can transport visitors through those stories with the ability to bring greater context as well to become more rich and more layered. There will be hopefully spaces of greater interaction as well. At the National Gallery, we've been exploring immersive storytelling, um, utilising a range of technologies to create single and multi-room experiences. Um, and we've been in, we've seen how these have had been very, very powerful for our visitors. Um, we've been able to expand the narrative of one, one painting and provide layers of context that combine art historical research and scientific knowledge in compelling, in compelling formats. Um, three examples of that that the gallery has most recently been produced, uh, Virtual Veronese, which is a VR headset experience played out in one of our main galleries in front of Paolo Veronese's Consecration of St. Nicholas. Leonardo experienced a masterpiece, which was a five room immersive um, exhibition that leads you through the mind of Leonardo da Vinci to explore his masterpiece, The Virgin of the Rocks. And then most recently, Sensing the Unseen, Step into Gossart's Adoration, which is a personal journey through Jan Gossart's Adoration of the Kings through soundscapes, spoken word, high resolution imagery and gesture based interaction. So this is uh, virtual very easy. Um, a vast amount of our paintings were created not for the walls of the gallery, but for somewhere else. And whether that's a church, a chapel or personal commission, often created with specific purpose or message to convey. Virtual Veronese was our first step into exploring VR for storytelling. And we worked in a co-funding model with Story Futures, UK government funded body set up to stimulate the UK economy, specifically around immersive storytelling. And Virtual Veronese was the first challenger project to be developed. It focused on Veronese's consecration of St. Nicholas, which was created for a church in at San Benedito El Po, Po in Northern Italy. What was great is that the project has challenged the gallery to think hard about how to script often quite deep and complex stories into a 10 minute experience. Um, to ex be exposed to a more rapid uh, method of digital production and to understand the visitor needs and ex expectations once they've been transported back in time from modern London to 16th century Italy. Next one was, uh, let's say, Leonardo experienced a masterpiece. Um, it's a project on a whole different scale and a major change in approach for our paid exhibition programme. Great in collaboration with UK-based Studio 59 Productions, it charts over five rooms the story of Leonardo da Vinci's Virgin of the Rocks and our deep understanding of the creation techniques and presentation of a painting that took 25 years to produce. The brief was to do this without words, to immerse the visitor in the story through visual and theatrical techniques and to bring them to the painting in a room called the Imagined Chapel, a chapel that no longer exists 
and with this digital version pieced together from archival research. Again, one painting explored in depth, inviting the visitor to take a much closer look and to give a broader understanding of how we, our, knowledge of, our knowledge of it. And finally, Sense in the Unseen, which again takes one painting, but this time focuses much more on the painting itself and the rich journey it takes you on. Created with extensive user research with a specific target audience and following human-centered design principles, the project set out uh, with one question to answer. How might we engage visitors in the visual detail of the painting and encourage slower looking? We aim to enable a meaningful and emotionally engaging experience accessible to diverse audiences, bringing to life the rich visual details at every level of the painting and the cyclical nature of the key themes of rupture, transformation and renewal. I guess to know deeply, one must look deeply. The fine experience made extensive use of sound to create a sonified painting that existed within a full room soundscape matching the depth and detail of the painting. The visitor moved from the painting to one of three pods where they could get closer to the detail using a gesture interface to journey through high res digital version. The experience continues back at the real painting with the voice of Balthazar. The guiding theme in the design of the experience was the re relevance of the painting to our world today. To emphasize the comparability, we commissioned Teresa Lola until recently young poet laureate for London to write a poem that explores Balthazar's experience of this transformative moment in time. These three projects all use new tools and methods in displaying and interpreting our paintings, drawing on data from new imaging techniques or creating experiences that can transport the visitor across time and location. Whilst none specifically utilise AI or machine learning, the gallery is applying these tools specifically in relation to visitor services and forecasting models, and also in relation to imaging techniques and deepening our scientific knowledge. On the forecasting side, we've been looking at how to build models that help identify what factors might be the most important in terms of visitor numbers, as well as using natural language processing across our social media engagement to help us identify key themes that people are engaging with. The gallery's scientific team are involved in several research projects that are exploring the use of machine learning with data sets from new imaging techniques to gain deeper insight into the construction and materiality of the collection. There is interest in how to capture that and include cultural heritage sector knowledge to enrich interpretation. There's a focus on tools and automation of methods both to deal with the overwhelming wealth of data, but also to fully integrate the data sets to see if there are things that might have been missed using more conventional approaches to processing the data, particularly in drawing on several types. Simple fact is that we know our audiences are fascinated about what lies beneath the painting and the work the gallery does behind the scenes. So there's never greater connection between the data that we have and the stories that we can tell. Thanks. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Michael, I'd like to hear your perspective on this question. Thanks, Tonya. Well, for myself, I really think the Museum of the Future will have this blend of historic objects, collections, and archives, and it will be fused with different combinations of emerging technology, um, most likely in areas related to socially generated big data, immersive VR experiences, like what Lawrence sort of showed there, and also various forms of, of AI. Um, I don't think we're gonna get in any way rid of analog and physical collections, but we're gonna find ways to um, develop not only newborn digital components and collections, but also take what we have and virtually augment them and, you know, to develop these sort of new experiences. And in terms of why I feel this way and know this, I would say it's because I come from that 70s generation that kind of witnessed the, the onset of the digital age sort of firsthand. Um, and, you know, I, so I lived through that in my childhood and also as, as an artist, I've, I've worked in this area for the better part of 25 years, um, uh, doing projects that sort of visualize big data that are, you know, about sort of building sort of new virtual worlds and systems. And also for the last sort of 10 years, I've done a lot of work with digital archives and collections. And in terms of sort of just showcasing one project, which I think actually sums up, is, is a good case study for the kind of things that I'm talking about. I just like to focus on a project I did with the British Library about two years ago called Imaginary Cities. And I'll just screen share here. And the project, which ended up being this major solo exhibition there in, in the library, um, 
was all about taking historic maps and using those as these sort of generative um, sort of seeds, if you will, for building these kind of digital fantastical cityscapes for the information age. But before I can kind of talk about that, I need to talk about the collection that it comes from um, that really kind of uh, not only inspired the project, but also the project is based on. And that's the one million images from Scan's book collection. And this is a collection that was um, created by the British Library in collaboration with Microsoft um, in sort of 2005, 2008. And it was a project that was looking at scanning about 65,000 uh, Victorian era books, mostly English language, so 19th uh, in 18th century uh, books. And from that, the researchers there at the BL then used various kind of image recognition techniques and machine learning to pull every single image from that sort of digitized collection and create this image database. And it ended up being around a million images. And at the time, British Library just wasn't quite sure what to do with this. And in 2013, they decided, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to actually put it onto Flickr Commons, copyright free. Anyone can use it. Um, and it was really quite amazing because there's just such a rich sort of um, varied materials there in this one million images collection. And of course, you know, when a collection becomes digital, all these other things kind of can happen. So, you know, you can start using big data methodologies to start kind of you know, sifting through. So, of course, what I was interested in is maps. So, of course, I used various techniques to then sort of take from the one million images to then go to the various maps. And then I wanted to get specific maps. So, you know, again, you could sort of drill down and say, pull out a map of London. And then in the end, sort of here is the map of London that I used for one of the artworks. So this idea of, you know, small data and getting precious data sort of within this big data collection, you know, that is only possible through using, um, you know, these new kind of processes and techniques that the digital affords us. And one thing you'll notice here looking at this particular slide is you have all this, these tags, this metadata. And this is another really good example of, say, machines and the, and the processes of the digital working alongside our analog human-based processes. So in terms of how the collection became enriched with various metadata and tags, it was through a combination of, on the human side, experts and then crowdsourcing and you know even members of the public coming in onto Flickr Commons and, and tagging these images. Um, and then on the other side, from the machine side, it was various researchers working with, uh, use different kind of uh, machine learning uh, techniques to do automated, automated sort of generation of tags. So it is sort of the sum total of these two. Um, and so that really kind of, for me, shows the power of this. And then as an artist, I was interested in not only using the digital collection item to make these sort of procedural cities, but I wanted to use also the metadata, that metadata that was changing on a day by day, sometimes on a, on an hourly basis. You know, I thought that was a really kind of nice poetic idea. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of the show, uh, I'll just show this very short video that the library put together to promote it. <laughs> And here are some images of the show. Um, one thing you'll notice in, in that is that um, there are, of course, artworks. Um, I did four particular pieces um, based on four cities. So one map, one installation, and, uh, and the, the pairs were basically um, two from Europe and two from North America. So from Europe, I, of course, it had to be uh, London and Paris, and from North America, I, I chose New York and Chicago. So this idea of using those maps, and as you'll see here in this slide, 
here are the actual four maps so the the in the books that they came from so this idea of bringing the kind of the digital and the physical together um you know was was quite important to me so this idea of that collection itself is this collection that embraces both the the digital and the physical and then you know using those maps and through the the sort of like the, um, the techniques that I developed, which also were putting on AI techniques to actually then manipulate those, to get the data, to then build these sort of digital experiences and these dis digital objects. So this idea of, you know, the physical getting then digitized and then it comes, you know, then gets processed by myself as an artist and then comes back into a physical form or as, you know, some kind of digital physical form like you, you know, kind of see here using a range of kind of digital manufacturing techniques and such. So, um, you know, even down to something like this, the, this is the Paris work here and that is, you know, digital print on gold gilded handmade objects. So, you know, that have been uh, procedurally generated, you know, through, through using machine techniques. And just to kind of finish up the, the last installation was a VR experience. And this also makes a really kind of nice point as well. One of the things I was hoping to achieve was not only show the public sort of all the interesting sort of possibilities of digital collections and research that had gone on in the BL over the last sort of 20 years that would make this sort of thing possible. But I wanted to also show how an artwork or creative experience can actually be an interface for a collection itself. So this particular piece, which is Imaginary Cities, New York City, um, is again based off an old sort of, it's an 18th century map of New York in the early times. And, you know, this actually gets generated every day live. So you get sort of using the, the, the combinations of the metadata that exist at that particular time when the city is generated, it's a brand new city for that moment in time that changes with interaction. Um, and one of the things that I did was actually every artwork, every installation had a QR code in a way to access the collection items. So people could actually be there in the library, enjoying the artwork. They could scan the QR code on their phone. They could see the collection item. They could interact with it. And then of course their interaction and, if, and also their tagging of things would they change the experience for people the next day. You know, so it's that, that idea of, you know, the virtuous circle and the connections that we can, we can build through, through the technologies we have now. So I think that's probably a good place to, for me to stop. Great. Thank you, Michael. Sarah, love to hear your perspective. Thanks, Tonya. And it's really great to be here with people who are talking about such interesting projects and that are quite different from, from ours. But um, there's a real interconnection in terms of the physical and digital. So... Uh, yes, you set us a challenge in terms of thinking about what the Museum of the Future is going to be. And um, from our perspective and from my perspective, we really believe that the Museum of the Future will be one where the stories are told by the protagonists themselves, by the people that went through um, those events or that the, the artists themselves. And that um, we will be able to converse and convene with the witnesses of history or with um, artists from a different time or from a different geography where we people can tell their own stories wherever they are in the world but also whenever they are in the world and although time travel itself isn't possible by creating these asynchronous conversations we're able to bring humans who might have lived at a different time or might be, have lived in a different place together with with the visitors to a museum and we we know that because of the very powerful response that we're getting to our work the forever project creates voice interactive encounters with people that you'd love to meet whether that's artists or witnesses or musicians and our work is both in the cultural sector and in uh, entertainment and, and art. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of the historical context in particular with regards to museums, um, our work started at the National Holocaust Central Museum, where we sought to preserve the experience that children have in meeting a Holocaust survivor. 
and not just meeting a survivor, but being able to ask that survivor questions about their life and experience. So um, we worked with 10 survivors. We integrated ultra high definition footage with natural language processing and voice recognition to enable kids in the future to be able to ask a digital image of that survivor question and, and receive a response automatically. That was both done as a physical installation at the museum, but also created, which is what we're doing now, um, creating it as a web-based experience. So as we touched on a little bit earlier through the other projects, this combination of this physical in-venue experience and online experience. So I'll just share a short video from some work we did with Munich University, who were also focusing on Holocaust survivor testimony. So in this video, you'll be able to see um, young people um, conversing, students at the university conversing with a uh, Holocaust survivor, a survivor, Abba Nell. Jüdische Holocaust-Überlebende Eva Umlauf nicht nur ihre Geschichte, sie antwortet auch auf Fragen. Die Zuschauer sehen sie dabei in 3D, denn die Aufnahmen sind ein sogenanntes interaktives digitales Zeugnis. Wie haben Sie es geschafft, weiterzumachen? Ich wollte leben, ich wollte nicht aufhören zu leben. Und hatte immer den Gedanken, dass diejenigen, die verschwunden sind, werden auch eines Tages zurückkommen. Auch das wollte, nicht, wollte ich nicht aufgeben. Weil das Aufgeben, das ist für mich, äh, mein ganzes Leben aufzugeben. Ich finde es sehr, sehr spannend und emotional. Vor allem die, die 3D-Darstellung ähm, macht das Ganze so live. Also man hat wirklich das Gefühl, dass aber ein Ohr vor einem sitzt. Ja, finde ich wirklich cool, dass man so ein bisschen auch merkt, seinen Charakter, wie er ist und seine Ausstrahlung kommt auch sehr gut rüber durch die ähm, 3D-Technik. So as you can hear through some of the young people talking about their experience, although they know it's video, the very nature of the fact that um, it is a significant installation that you can ask questions makes it feel like a more sort of personal and immersive encounter than you would otherwise get. Uh, in addition to working with that quite powerful and challenging content, we're also creating experience with musicians. So we've been very fortunate to work with Nile Rogers, who is the international uh, musician and producer and the man behind hundreds of hits. Uh, and what we've been able to create in association with the National Portrait Gallery is a digital voice interactive, voice interactive portrait of Nile. And that's manifest across two different platforms. So one, it's a VR experience. So people can enter a, a VR space, encounter Niall and ask him questions about his life and experience. He might even play something for you. And also the same content is manifested on as a web browser online experience. So you can have a voice interactive conversation with Niall wherever you are. I'll just show you a still from that so you can get an idea of what it looks like. So that is the marvellous Nile Rogers um, thoroughly enjoying himself on set. And I wanted to share that image because a lot of organisations are currently working with deep fakes, which I completely understand why. One of the reasons why we're sticking with video at the moment is the, the authenticity of this human to human connection that is so important in terms of the, the visceral understanding of that individual that, that, that you get through this type of content. And it's very difficult to fake laughter, experience, wisdom, and it makes a, makes a fundamental difference to the way in which people interpret digital media. I hope that gave you a good insight into, into what we're trying to achieve. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, I think each of you have presented a really exciting vision for the future in terms of museums. Uh, but what I find myself being curious about now is, um, you know, when we first started having this discussion, it was pre-COVID. Um, and now we've had a period of time where COVID has forced us to shut down and um, to, to in engage digitally. And I was just wondering, um, from your perspectives, you know, how has the digital shift 
that has been driven by COVID changed your point of view or reinforced your point of view about where we're gonna go in terms of the future of museums in this kind of immersive AI world? Um, Sarah, could, could you answer that question first? Yeah, so I think that it's really reinforced our work and the need for the work. I think it's really reinforced the need to be multi-platform. I think if you're not able to respond to changes in needs for digital experiences and, and move across physical and digital, as Michael was touching on earlier on, uh, you're creating a lot of risk. And I think that a lot of organisations have for a long period of time treated digital as a kind of add-on that they really should be thinking about but they never get the time they've never got the money it's always something that's a kind of um, they put in their innovation innovation pot rather than something that's fundamental and I really hope that what's happened with the pandemic is that people are seeing digital as something they need to plan in to embed firmly into everything they're doing uh, in a much more strategic and ambitious and, and risk-taking way than they ever have done. And, and I think from that point of view, that acceleration um, w w will be significant over the next couple of years. Great, thanks. Um, Michael, what, what's, what's your kind of take on that? How has COVID shifted things from your perspective? Well, for myself, I, um, I really think that it's reinforced my thoughts um, you know, for the last 10 years, I've really kind of been trying to get things off the screen, absolutely off the screen and into a physical experience, but also in something like you saw with the Imaginary Cities or the work that I'm doing with the National Archives right now, because I'm their artist in residence there at the archives, is um, thinking about how to develop, you know, things that are physical, that kind of bring the two worlds together. And in terms of that idea of having this kind of, um, you know, this augmented experience that, you know, I think COVID has absolutely reinforced that insofar as that we miss, we will crave, we will come out of this wanting all those physical things, you know, the enjoyment of culture is, is often not a solitary thing. We want to be with people in spaces, you know, you don't want to just watch the film at home on your laptop. You want to be in the cinema, you know, you want to go to the theater, you want to go to the gallery, you want to actually go with your friends and your families, your colleagues, you know, you want to have those nice kind of connections where all of a sudden you might meet someone you don't know. You know, we want all of these things, these things that we can't do in our house. But I think that one of the things like what Sarah was talking about is that over this sort of forced different way of living that we've all been experiencing that we, you know, um, I, I think the public will gain a new appreciation for things that are digital and they will see and start to understand what is possible. And um, I do think that there will be um, certain kinds of expectations there because, you know, when we've, when we've been limited to being at home, you know, and we still can actually have enjoyment. We can still kind of reach out into culture and they will, you know, the average person will have experienced so many different things and then will they, will they necessarily want to go back to just the kind of the standard old school analog only experience? I would say no, because they'll, they'll have seen other possibilities. Um, and I think, you know, everyone you've assembled here, um, you know, we are all sort of trying to get those sort of possibilities to come together. And I, and I think so I, I do think when we emerge from this, it will be, um, it will be positive for the kind of work that we're trying to accomplish. Thank you, Michael. Um, Lawrence. What's your perspective? Gosh, there's there's so much to say about the learning of the last or the learnings using awful phrase of the last twelve months. Um, I mean, it's affected us in so many so many ways. I mean, it should be said that the Goss art experience that I that I've shown, um, you know, was in production through the whole of this period, and and the way we had to change even thinking about what was going to be produced, you know, was was something that was seriously considered and created difficulties in terms of the production, in terms of how we were even ways of working. But all that, because that project was was rooted in quite an agile process, we were able to kind of find our way through and, and, and still keep the themes, but turn things around to kind of be presented, knowing that we were going to open. Um, the project actually was open for seven days and had to close. So it's kind of then flipped things around again. And we've already been <clears throat> developing an online version of, of that particular project um, during this period of, of lockdown in the UK, um, which will hopefully be out before we actually reopen again. But 
I think, as, as Michael just said there, in many respects, it's opened a lot of opportunities. The National Gallery was in quite a good position in terms of its digital offering across everything that we do. But it was, as Sarah said, it still felt, not with the sort of, you know, over to the side, but it was some things are kind of treated as on their own, whether that's social media or whether that's, it's, to the, it's, it's to over there doing its separate thing. And I think what's really happened is that for some people that didn't even know these things were there, have been really craving it and therefore exposed them, found themselves wanting that culture and realising that actually there's a lot of digital content and digital culture available. And then that's leading to the acceptance, actually, of, of using digital to actually engage with the sort of themes or the content that we have. So this this barrier between the the real and the and the digital was kind of, especially the National Gallery, and I think for all places which have authentic objects, it's always been this this sort of tussle between the authentic object and and the, and the digital. We've never, in all the projects I've presented, it was never about trying to present one or the other. It was always, always about utilising the tools to bring you back to the artefact, to look at it with fresh eyes and to, to really understand the materiality or the kind of the, the real. And I think I think what's, what's potentially very positive and certainly through all the surveys that we've done during this period and, and the way people have engaged with our digital content, I think it, it has opened up opportunities because people are maybe a bit more accepting, even down to doing an online course, you know, and that, that's sort of something they might not have considered and our people are craving it. So, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about how people might be more accepting um, of, of using digital cult technologies for, for consuming culture in this way. Fantastic. Thank you. I mean, just kind of building on, Lawrence, what you were saying, and Sarah, what you were saying about the, you know, kind of the merging of digital and physical and not thinking of those as separate silos um, and, and any other thoughts. I mean, I guess for those museum practitioners who are out there, um, you know, what needs to change about the way museums operate in order to be able to kind of capitalize on the advantage, advantages of, of new technologies and digital? What do you think needs to shift? It's very, it's, 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 it's an interesting moment, I think. There's a lot of work going on around kind of skill sets in museums and galleries. You know, there's a, there's a few major projects that are happening that are, are really examining that. And it's, it's an ever-changing never change your thing. I mean, I've been in museums and galleries for, for quite a few years and, and seen it change even in the time I've been here in terms of the backing an organisation might give to it. Or, But I think I think technologies are cheaper and, and um, therefore there's, there's a wealth of opportunities. I, it really does come down to audiences, though. I think it's never, you know, we're never going to try and, you know, we obviously look at what's going on around other organisations, but it's, it's never about kind of trying to recreate what someone else has necessarily done. It's always got to think about, well, what is your, what is your real reason for, for the work that you have, the collection that you have, or the, the, the stories you're trying to tell, and, and really understanding the audiences. The, the Gossart example, I, I can't stress it enough, is that you know, we worked with over 70 members of the public on that project throughout the whole of the project. And it's not about, um, you know, them dictating what we were going to do, but it was just that trialing and prototyping and, and investing in that kind of process ended up and leads to a really, really rigorously tested project, which will, will benefit everybody. And I think, you know, that that's, you know, the praise we've had for that project has, has really highlighted that. And I think it, it takes, you know, it is a bit about skill sets, but it's, it's kind of how you set up the process of the, of the project itself um, and, and trial and error and, and not being afraid to, afraid to fail as well. I think you've got to kind of try some of those things to, to understand what does and doesn't work um you know we're lucky we have uh, when we're open we have a gallery with lots of engaged people so we're trying to encourage uh, all aspects of our projects to go out onto the gallery floor and test 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 with people just to to get the right kind of outcome great um michael i mean because you you know you work as an artist and you work with the british library so you have kind of a bit of an outsider's perspective on that i i wonder yeah. what your thoughts are about how you think institutions that hold collections need to be able to change to work with people like you or to be able to capitalize on the technology available? Well, I mean, I've been fortunate to work with institutions that are, that are willing to, um, to explore this area and also willing to um, change normal practice. So if I think about the two sort of major residencies I've had in the last three or four years with the British Library and the National Archives, which are two, the, you know, the two main memory institutions of the UK. And, and they've been very receptive to, to, you know, I was actually invited to come in and to work with them. 
um, and they were willing to learn from me. And I thought that was really wonderful um, because it wasn't that I was having to come in as an artist who's been working in this area for sort of decades, you know, and just thinks about sort of technology and the creative uses of technology on just, you know, pretty much every waking moment um, that we, we could find sort of common points, common intersections, and that they were open to trying new things. So like one of the things that kind of really struck me from what Lawrence had just said is this idea of getting feedback of, you know, of having things be, you know, participatory for, for audiences or developing new audiences and coming with an open mind, um, being willing to be agile to sort of to prototype things. So it's funny, I mean, I use the term prototyping all the time for both of those projects. The first sort of phase was about developing prototypes and then getting feedback before we then move on to the, the, the finished kind of experiences. Um, and sort of, so to do that kind of project, you know, you, you do need development time, you do need resources. It's, you know, it's not some kind of, um, it can't be some kind of cheap cousin of the physical, you know, traditional experience. So, you know, um, I, you know, I think that's that's one of the the important things. And I and I hope one of my hopes is that um, more institutions will actually engage with that because now that they've gone through this period where that's all they've got, you know, once we emerge from it, they'll they'll actually be willing to take some more risks because actually they're not risks. There, you know, there are opportunities to kind of push new boundaries, and you can, you know, do that with collaboration. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of my my thoughts about it. Great, um, and Sarah, I mean, as a kind of, I guess, technology partner with institutions, I guess, what would be your perspective on this on this question? I think um, just picking up on some of the the themes that Michael and Lawrence have, have said, I think there's this issue around moving from digital new new techniques or exploring new techniques as being somewhat of a gimmick you know uh, to attract funding for example to something which is an attitude which is more about how can those organizations plan for getting real value so both being exploratory and um, risk-taking but also thinking about how the the depth so both the projects that um, Michael and Lawrence have talked about seem to have a real richness to them. So there's elements of sort of co-creation and involvement of the audience and um, speaking to people and, and the richness of the actual experiences themselves, which are really sort of multi-layered as, as far as I can see. And with our own work, there's the, the richness of the conversational content and, and, and the assets. So, um, and I think if, if organisations can see those, both the processes and the outcome, as being something that has depth and value rather than something somewhat sort of flippant as a sort of digital aside, um, I think then they'll really start to invest and explore and think about themselves as institutions completely differently. I mean, it's one of just really briefly, it's one of the things I, I've I find really interesting um, still working with the National Holocaust Centre and Museum, which is a very small, you know, a medium sized museum in the UK. But because they've got such an interesting attitude now to digital reach, they don't see themselves as that size because the digital work they do can reach can reach kids throughout the country. And that's really important, I think. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you know, you know, we obviously we've all presented quite an optimistic and, and really exciting um, kind of vision of the future. Um, but there is always, a, you know, there are always disadvantages to technology. Um, and I was wondering, I wanted to have a conversation really about ethics. And I mean, Sarah, you mentioned in your presentation about deep fakes versus what your organization is doing. And I, I was hoping you could kind of kick off by kind of highlighting what you think are the challenges, ethical challenges that might come out of using these technologies and just what should people be aware of? One of the things to keep an eye on at the moment is um, Adobe's Content Authenticity Initiative, which, as many people watching this might know, is really trying to look at how can people um, see through uh, what has been done to, to digital media so that there's an understanding that people can assess 
what has happened to a digital piece before they see it. And um, so I think there'll still be a growing uh, concern about what's real and what isn't. How do you prove something's real? Um, is this is this a real piece of footage? Is it not? And I think the Content Authenticity Initiative and other initiatives like that could make a big difference in terms of trust. But also I think um, us looking at and in working with young people on um, who's sitting behind. So if you're working with an AI, for example, or an AI, AI interface, who we should be asking questions, who is putting those words in that person's mouth? How old are they? What sex are they? What race are they? How are they, you know, what their personality is? Because there's a huge difference between what might be presented to you and who is feeding that that AI, um, the, 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 the lines to talk really. So I, I, I have got some concerns about that and I'm pleased that it's becoming more of a discussion point going forward. Um, Michael, do you have any thoughts on the question of ethics? Absolutely, it's, it's something that probably most of my projects for the last 20 years in some way touch on. Um, you know, I, I think Undoubtedly, we live in a day and age of um, things like racist AI and deep fakes. Um, for me, the problem, you know, with something like, say, a deep fake is, uh, first and foremost, it's about sort of issues of consent in the subject themselves. So I really, really appreciate what Sarah has done in, in terms of the projects that she has helped develop, because it puts the create it, it puts the person the subject you know they're right and center when it comes to sort of their rights and how they want to present themselves you know deep fakes are are a deeply disturbing thing for me you know not only in terms of issues we you know we hear about them in terms of fake news but in terms of sort of rights of the individual you know um, and i think that's something that often gets lost and then moving on to things like, say, you know, racist AI, the fact that we've actually seen this and we've seen this come out of, you know, big technology providers like Microsoft had that, you know, really sort of um, well-known example from years ago. You know, I, I think as um, cultural institutions and museums and galleries, you know, start to use, you know, these technologies, they have to be aware of this as an absolute problem. And that we can't just leave the machine to do its own thing. You know, we have to understand that, you know, um, that collections have inherent biases. I mean, look at the One Million Images collection that I used. It's a white Western-centric Victorian area era collection. You know, there are absolute biases there. Um, you know, and during the course of my project with the BL, you know, um, often we found these really challenging source books you know, that you, you, you know, you could not show them today without proper sort of contextualization, you know, and, and careful curation, um, you know, so on one hand, you, you don't want to burn the book, but on the other hand, you know, you can't just put it out there or even worse, let some kind of machine learning, you know, just make decisions for you, you know, be, because if you remove the, the person, then you have those issues. So that's sort of on one side of things. On the other side that I find, you know, deeply problematic, and hopefully people will be thinking more about this because of the pandemic, is the digital divide. So I've sort of preached about the digital divide and sort of digital access for the better part of 20 years. Um, you know, and the pandemic has absolutely brought that into focus. So we talk about all these wonderful things. We talk about augmentation of collections and we have to understand that, you know, if we're thinking about things like, say, access to come into a, a great institution like the National Gallery, you know, there, there are always, you know, issues there of, you know, who has access and ease of access to that physically. But we, you know, as we develop sort of augmented digital virtual experiences, that also has access requirements. And I really hope institutions and the wider public will be thinking about that because what we don't want to do is create sort of um, another kind of layer of, of people that don't have access, that, you know, that are excluded. So those are the things that kind of come to my mind. Thanks, Michael. Lawrence, any, any final thoughts on that question? Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a few things for us. I mean, um, you know, obviously as a 200 year old institution, 
you know, it's all about the authenticity of the works, and we know that there's, there's fakes within within the art market. And I think that's you know, we have, I think museums and galleries have a role to play with this this subject matter actually in terms of culture. And I think we're all learning actually in terms of, um, as you say, Michael, things start to become much more embedded in, in processes and, and ways of working. So I think I think museum and galleries do, do have a, a role to tell, and just in, in terms of examining their own collections and the inherent biases that would already be in those collections and using tools to even uncover those rather than it kind of being the other way around. Um, we were lucky enough to participate in the museum's um, AI network a, a year or so ago, which is organised by Goldsmiths and Pratt Institute in America, and it's an exchange between UK and US institutions. And that was a really enlightening exercise because, you know, this is still new to, to many people, including myself and many other colleagues. And I think what, what was great about that kind of collaboration and network was again, bring it back to school and um, to skill sets and kind of teaching, you know, new new methods need sort of new levels of teaching and kind of the, the toolkit that came out of that project was kind of what questions do people have to ask when thinking about the use of this type of um, machine learning or AI and to understand those biases that might be put into the machine as it starts to work. So I think, you know, we're, it's very, very new and it's very, very, we're, we're sort of using it on many levels, but we do have to ask ourselves those questions. But I do think museums and galleries have a strong role to play in them. Great, thank you so much. Okay, I've got two more questions before we end. Um, and so, um, and, and, and basically, you know, they, they spanned audiences and collections. So how will things be different in terms of how audiences think about museum collections in their own lives, um, given the advances that you've been talking about? And then kind of how will we think about collecting differently um, in the future? So Michael, do you want to take that question first about how audiences think about museums differently um, in the future? And then how will we think about collecting differently? Well, I think one of the things that audiences will um, perhaps take on board and, and indeed maybe even expect is this notion of a personalized experience. So, you know, as soon as you make um, some kind of uh, digital or virtual augmentation to something, you know, that inherently should be personalized. If it's not, as a, as a technology designer, you know, creative use of technology, you've kind of failed. Um, so yeah, so having that as kind of, you know, those, those personal aspects, um, you know, which, which are nice because, you know, if you look at the way technology gets used, you know, really kind of across the board in society, it is all about, you know, the personal, the ephemeral, you know, that kind of real time experience. So I think, I think audiences will, will, will strive and indeed seek those things out and combine those again with the things that they like from the traditional physical collective space experience. It's gonna be that. In terms of collecting, I mean, that's, um, that's another, you know, really kind of challenging area. And I think um, museums will and institutions will have to sort of spend a lot of time developing those resources. So if you think about issues of digital preservation, um, you know, again, you know, that's a completely different skill set. I mean, you know, if you if you think about sort of collecting from the analog age, you know, we have a long history of knowing how to do that, you know, but if you're looking at things that are augmented or born digital, you know, those particular aspects, which are some of the most important, I would say the most important things being generated at this moment in time, you know, how do we actually keep those? How do we preserve those? You know, don't even get into this idea of collecting, you know, let's, you have to be able to preserve it first. So with that in mind, I mean, I almost kind of to think back to, you know, what Sarah presented, you know, this idea of, you know, recording, you know, and, and maybe taking keys from looking at how do you preserve live performance, live, live people, you know. Um, of course, if I'm going to have an experience of talking to a Holocaust survivor, I would rather talk to the Holocaust survivor. But of course, at some point that becomes impossible. So say Sarah's project of actually building this experience that's authentic, that allows you to tap into that, it, you know, it's some it, you know, it gives you something, you know, so I think we have to, in terms of collecting and preservation, we have to think along those lines that we aren't going to always be able to, you know, like in real life, you know, you know, record, capture, you know, you can't have that absolute sort of concrete thing, whatever that is, it's going to have to be some derivative of that. And I think we have to be willing to accept that, you know, um, and, and find ways to then kind of move forward with models of collection and preservation, you know, knowing that. 
Thank you. Um, Lawrence, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think Michael summed it up beautifully. <laughs> Is there, I think it's maybe, I mean, on the first one in terms of um, collecting differently, I think, I think yes, that the whole area of kind of born digital content and, and drawing those connections between things is, is, is kind of more the, more the thing. Maybe it's not about um, collecting differently, it's connecting differently. Maybe there's something in terms of how we have to think about how you know, museums and galleries are particularly good at joining those connections. There are many projects that are on the go at the moment which are really, really trying to strive to get to that better place where where we are able to join connections between different type of collections and different institutions. And I think that that really is where some powerful stories might start to happen. I think that's where it's quite exciting. Um, in terms of audience engaging differently, it's, it, it's, it, COVID has taught us two new words. It, it's pivoting and blended. And I think the, <laughs> we've moved out of pivoting at the moment and we're starting to move into the blended world where Everything is is that thing of engagement will become very different. You know, coming into into a museum, it may not be that you're. I mean, you can already do this now, but you come into the gallery and you may be picking up your information from various sources. But I think that's the blended model of how you experience the physical and digital will become ever some more ever more so. Um, and and it's a an area we've museum guys have really struggled to to get to in terms of thinking about the pre, the during, and the post visit. And I think that's that work get ever to, ever to tighter, I think, and people will have a, a chance of a more personalised and, uh, yeah, more personalised experience when they come to, to venues. Great, fantastic. And Sarah, would you like the final word? Well, I'm, I'm sort of agreeing with, um, cha I wish, yes, championing um, and channeling Lawrence and Michael's comments there as well. So um, a couple of things I just thought about adding with regards to that um, around audiences engaging differently and um, this blended experience I, I hope that organizations will sort of move towards um, increased thinking about partnerships collaborations um, broadcast connections those sorts of things and and um, increasingly see themselves as both the physical this physical location but also being much more um confident about taking their own collections out not necessarily physically but virtually in a more imaginative way to create this blended experience so that um go going back to michael's point about the, how important physical experiences are and that we'll all be rushing to them um when things open up but but also for 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 people that live miles and miles away the thought of getting on a coach or a train for five hours is going to become even less kind of enticing to a certain extent so being able to create things which are really engaging where they are rather than just a sort of add-on will is really exciting I think there's an enormous amount of amount of potential there um, and on the collecting an artifacts issue yes I'd written down in big big letters preservation and data storage um and, and I think it will, metadata and provenance of digital assets and how you can prove authenticity for example is, is going to be really important too thank you I, I want to thank the entire panel for a really stimulating discussion I mean you know I think I think what's clear is that the kind of future of museums is one in which you will be able to traverse time, you know, you, from the past to the, to, the, to the kind of future. And while you'll be able to tra traverse space, you know, you'll be able to be in different places. And that is really, really exciting. Um, in addition to that, I think audiences will have the time, have, have the ability to interact in unprecedented ways that will allow them to be a real player in what is being kind of produced in real time. Um, and I think, you know, for museums, it sounds like from what you all have said is the challenge is not to prioritize the physical over the digital or the digital over the physical, but it's about how you integrate those two in thinking about your audience and in service of your audience. Um, and so that's what's really, really important in this. And we will have to keep our eyes on the ethical issues and make sure that we have that transparency. And me coming from a museum's background, you know, museums are really, really good at being very careful in their consideration of what they present and how they present it. And I think that will be um, an ongoing challenge going, go, going forward. I think in terms of 
you know, just, just thinking about what we need to kind of take away from, from all of this. I mean, it just, it just feels very much like the time for museums and people who have collections, it's going to be vibrant. It's going to be such a vibrant and great time. And it's just about having the people who have the skills, expertise, and being, I think, I think being open to experimentation. That's what I've gathered from all of you is creating environments that are open to experimentation and trusting that experimentation and pro prototyping to kind of chart the path forward. So thank you all for your fantastic contributions. Um, and I hope the audience has enjoyed this session. Thank you.